Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining this talk. I'm Mark Anderson. I'm an ecologist and I direct the Nature Conservancy's Center for Resilient Conservation Science. I'm also the board chair of Northeast Wilderness Trust, a small regional land trust in New England that protects forever wild land. I named this talk Reanimating the Land. I hope that's provocative. And by the end of the talk, I think you'll see why I chose that name. There have been major changes in the science of botany and zoology and ecology over the last two decades. Much of what I learned in high school and in college has been refuted and replaced with better science that fits the evidence. And there have been breakthroughs galore. My goal in this talk is to give you a quick and visual tour of the new science of plants, animals, and land. There is no time for detail, so I put a list of all the references and books that go with each slide in a separate PDF that's now posted on the Land Trust Alliance website. So let's go. I love the way indigenous cultures talk about plants and animals as our relatives, because they are. Meet Luca, the last universal common ancestor She's our shared great, 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 great grandmother, about three or four billion greats. Most life on earth is still single-celled, but one of her daughters, Lika, the last eukaryotic common ancestor, developed a nucleus, making it much easier to build complex multicellular life. And Lika gave rise to all plants, animals, and fungi. Although if you look at us, we have very different types of bodies and life histories, but if you look at our cells, you can barely tell us apart. The take home message is that each species on earth today has a long evolutionary history and they have changed and grown as they've solved the challenges that life poses. And if you trace it far enough back, we all become intertangled. So let's start with a deeper dive into plants. People have been trying to figure out plants for a long time. In the 1600s, scientists noticed that if they put a five pound sapling in a pot of soil, after five years, it will have increased in weight by 30 fold. Where did all that plant matter come from? Not from the soil because the soil weighed the same. It took another hundred years before Joseph Priestley figured out that plants were materializing out of thin air. This is not a metaphor. Leaves absorb invisible molecules of carbon dioxide and using light energy, they split the molecules into oxygen, which is released, and carbon, which is converted to sugars and carbohydrates, organic matter, or food. When you see a forest, all that solid, heavy trunk, leaf, and root was once carbon molecules in the air around it. Well, now we know that plants are living solar collectors and that each leaf is a solar panel. The more panels there are, the more carbon that is being absorbed. Trees with a huge canopy like this one is absorbing a lot of carbon. Where does it all go? Well, this was not actually known until 2016 when science, scientists released labeled carbon molecules in the air around the upper canopy so they could follow its path through the system. Some carbon molecules went to the trunk and some went to new leaves, but most of the carbon went to the roots and up to 40% of that was being shared with other trees. Mycorrhizal fungi linked the roots together into a connected network and carbon flowed through it, creating a shared carbon pool. This finding shook the science world because we thought plants were competing, but instead they are working together. The forest is almost like one giant organism. Suzanne Simard and her students have mapped out the root webs that form around big old trees. 
this this kooky diagram with the green circles is that web around an old tree. She calls them mother trees because they nurture saplings and seedlings that link into that network and it increases their chance of survival. This has been demonstrated quantitatively. Just like human mothers, she even sends a little extra carbon to her own offspring. Mycorrhizal networks go way back to the very first land plants and are present in most species. They look like little white threads in the soil. You've probably seen them if you've dug around. Plants feed the fungi with carbon and the fungi take up nutrients from the soil and transfer it to the plants. They can do that better than the roots, so it's a symbiotic relationship. In 2017, scientists discovered that the fung fungal networks degrade when land is cleared or sprayed with herbicides. So when we restore a healthy forest or grassland, that network becomes denser and more diverse, building resilience and storing more carbon. But this takes time. That's why perpetuity and conservation is so important. Our tree friend is also monitoring her visual environment. She's looking around. Like us, she's using photoreceptors. We have four types, red, green, blue, and light dark, and they're in our eyes. We take the light images in, we take the light in and assemble it into an image. Well, plants have 11 types of photoreceptors. They see a lot more colors including ultraviolet and infrared. And those receptors are all over their above ground bodies. They signal to the plant when to grow, which direction to grow, when to start flowering, when to fruit, etc. So does that mean that a plant can see us when we walk by? Yes, a group at MIT called Cyborg Botany has figured out how to use a nanowire to convert a plant's chemical responses into electrical signal that can be detected. When this scientist in the upper two panels stands up and sits down, or in the second panel walks across the room, the plant is totally tracking it. You can see it in this little wave or in this little vibrating line. Not only tracking it, but seeing the difference between stand up, sit down, or walk across the room. Cyborg Botany has even developed a hybrid plant robot that moves towards light on its own plant power. It's the scene at the bottom. You turn a light on and the plant moves. Watch these videos. All right. I've already told you that plants can see us. They share carbon. They nurture their offspring. Next, I'm going to tell you that they talk. Yes. In 1980, scientists found that if they had a bunch of potted plants and they tore the leaves on one, the chemistry changed on the ones around it. Somehow the plant was signaling to the others. It turns out that plants have a sophisticated communication system. If a plant, for example, it, it, this has now been worked out in some detail, if a plant is being munched by aphids, it releases volatile organic compounds, VOCs. You can think of them as scents. And those scents say aphids, and neighboring plants pick these up, and in turn, they alter their chemistry, and they release VOCs that repel aphids. Plants can even tell if the signal is coming from a different species or from their own kin. The potted plant on the far left has family growing to the top and below it, and it's altered its growth pattern apparently to share light with its siblings. See these ones here. If this all sounds impossible, well, we can do it too. You've heard the expression smell fear. That comes from the fact that when we experience strong emotions, our chemistry changes and we release VOCs. If you're standing close by someone who's terrified, you will pick that up and your chemistry will alter. 
Just imagine developing this ability to a high degree over 500 million years, and you'll start to understand plant communication. So far, I've stressed how plants are similar to us, but they are also quite different. For one thing, plants are modular. They're like Lego. You can take one piece and build a whole new plant from it, which makes them super resilient. Meet Pando, the largest known living organism on Earth. At 108 acres and 6,000 tons, he is a male aspen tree who looks like a forest because his underground stems can root and develop new trunks. At somewhere between 3,000 and 14,000 years old, his original trunk has long ago decayed away, but he just keeps developing new ones, making him potentially immortal. And because the new ones develop at the edge, he is slowly moving across the landscape. Well, as we head towards what some scientists call the sixth extinction, plants are really our natural partners. A 2015 revised analysis of the fossil records suggests that the five previous extinctions on Earth have been catastrophes mostly for animals. Plants diversified. Many indigenous conservationists that I have been talking with put plants front and center in their conservation planning. I've been asked, why is Western conservation so animal focused? I don't know the answer to that, but I suspect that it's our outdated science. I was taught that plants were passive and inert, sort of a living material. That makes us forget or not even realize how blessed we are to share the earth with these remarkable creatures. Robin Wall Kimmerer calls them amazing creative beings and Nicholas Rio refers to them as persons and nations in their own right. Now that is language that fits the science. Okay, let's move on with animals. Take a deep breath and clear your head. Now we're gonna talk about us. Let's get this out of the way first. The idea that animals are mechanical things running on instinct has been thoroughly debunked. Hundreds, probably thousands of studies show that they think and feel. I'm not even gonna go there in this talk, but I highly recommend Francis DeWall's book. Uh, are we smart enough to know how smart animals are and mama's last hug? Just for a quick example, animal thinking can be very species specific. Birds, for example, have incredible spatial memories. Hummingbirds keep track of how much nectar is in every flower they visit. And on return trips, they only visit the ones that had a lot. Clark nutcrackers can remember the exact location of tens of thousands of seeds for up to nine months. The average human grad student can't do anything like that. In contrast to thinking, emotions are like a universal language among vertebrates, at least, and they help us regulate our social interactions and call us to action. We now know that our emotions are based in neurochemical changes. And when tested, other animals show these same chemical changes. That's why you might not know exactly what that chickadee outside is thinking as she screams at a blue jay near her nest, but you know exactly what she's feeling. The big science news in conservation is that if we want thriving animals, we need to create the conditions for thriving families. This is very hard to do, and in most places, it's not happening. Places where families produce surplus offspring, that's more offspring than parents, so two parents, three offspring, are called source areas and they export juveniles to the larger landscapes. 
For a long time, scientists thought Treelease Woods was a great place for birds because it was always full of birds. Going back to the 1920s, they had great records and there were no obvious declines. But when scientists started measuring for successful reproduction, it was not happening or so low to be negligible. Treelease Woods was a sink. Every year, the birds were being imported in from a source area far away, probably in the Ozarks. If we're not creating and protecting source areas in our conservation, we are in trouble. Try to view the woods on your lands through the eyes of an animal wanting to raise a family. Is there shelter for a nest? Is there safety from predators? from brood parasites, from diseases, from injuries? Is there privacy and quiet? Is there plenty of food? Are there insects and berries? Is there a source of clean water? To sustain diversity, we need to create source areas. The sobering news is that we are in an abundance crisis. There are three billion less birds in North America than in the 70s. The bars on this graph show the extent of the decline in almost every habitat. Insects have also declined precipitously and the ranges of most large animals have shrunk. Our animal families are not self-replacing. We need to restore the quality of these habitats to turn them from sinks into sources. This is working for wetlands. As you see this bar up here in blue, thanks to billions of dollars spent on protection, restoration, and better hunting regulations, the abundance of birds, at least, is increasing in wetland habitats. This is a reversible trend that we can be a part of. The other pinch point of vulnerability for animals is dispersal. We kick our kids out of our homes at about 18 years saying, you are on your own. But really they are not. They have a vast social network supporting them. Parents, relatives, peers, friends, teachers, employers. They learn to be adults from their social network. This is exactly the same in animals. Studies show, first of all, that they recognize individual faces and they understand the relationships in their networks, even wasps. Adolescent animals have so much to learn, how to find food, how to avoid predators, how the dominance hierarchies work and how spatial territories are laid out, how courtship works and how to develop the skills to attract their mate, to attract a mate, they watch their peers and adults intensely and they imitate and practice. Much of what you see when you're casually watching nature is this imitation and practice. All of this is learned information and it's passed down through generations. So much so that species with wide geographic ranges do things very differently in different parts of their range. In humans, this is what we call culture. There have now been thousands of captive releases and reintroductions. This is great work, which I support, but the failure rate is intense, 89%. A major reason is that species need those social networks to learn how to live. It's not simply a connect the dots game. We have to keep the landscape permeable so species can bring along their social networks, their history, and their culture. That's why we have started modeling connectivity as the gradual movement of populations across the landscape. This is important. Under climate change, species need to move. Recent studies of North American mammals have found that very few are expanding their ranges. And you know these few, coyote, raccoon, skunk, fox. 
most of our large mammals, their ranges have contracted, sometimes dramatically. Let's end this section on animals talking about beauty. Immanuel Kant's statement, only humans are capable of appreciating beauty, is one of the most misinformed statements ever spoken. Nature is so colorful because birds and insects perceive a wide array of color, more than we do, and they are intensely attracted to it, increasing it over time. We have flowers because bees, butterflies, and birds are attracted to color and fragrance. Birds are so beautiful because their mates are attracted to color and pattern and continually select for it. The same is true for sound and fragrance. Some species like bower birds who built this uh, little grass shelter and puffer fish even make art. Are wild creatures sovereign beings with the right and power to make decisions and take actions in their own interests? That is a moral and ethical question, not a science question, and you have to answer it for yourself. But I posit that some of the old faulty science has made us comfortable with treating plants and animals in ways that under the new science we might think differently about. Update your science and explore some of the writings of others who are struggling with these questions. All right, land. Land is the stage on which all the interactions of the biotic world occur. Ten years ago, my friend Charles Faree and I were trying to predict how many species were in every state in the East. We started with climate variables, but they were not working too well. Then we added in a bunch of geophysical variables and suddenly we were getting amazing results. In fact, you can predict almost exactly how many species are in each state in the East just by knowing how many types of geology the state has, what is the elevation range and the latitude, and how much limestone. Species diversity is an expression of the land. That's why conserving land is so important under climate change. And that's why to conserve diversity, we need a network of sites all over the country representing all the different types of land. One big area can only conserve the diversity of that area. Here's a site in the Flint Hills of Kansas. It's on shallow soil over limestone bedrock. So now we can ask, does it have healthy soils? Is that mycorrhizal network intact? Is the water quality good? Are the processes like fire still happening? Unless we restore the stage, it's hard to get the biota right because the flora and fauna are an expression of the stage. Last year, I learned that French winemakers have a word for this, terroir. It means the soil, bedrock, and microclimate. The exact same type of grape, say Cabernet Sauvignon, will taste different if it's grown in different terroirs. Some if they're right next to each other. A great wine taster can take a sip and say, oh, this is from a south-facing limestone slope. Well, this is my new goal in life. Send me an email if you want to work on this with me. But conservationists have a word for this too. Wilderness. It literally means will of the land. I don't know how it came to mean remote distant areas, but let's reclaim this word and let's work to make our own reserves express the will of the land. The land also creates and influences the climate. The ground collects and radiates heat and topography redistributes, redistributes local temperatures and moisture. There are whole textbooks on this but I don't recommend them. They're highly mathematical 
And besides, you already know this. Think of a slope like this one here with snow on the north side and dry sun on the south side. Even a small amount of topography can create major temperature and moisture differences. Species are totally tuned in to these microclimates created by the land, and they distribute themselves in relation to them. That means areas with a lot of connected microclimates are buffered from regional climate effects because species can move around locally, their populations, to find their needed climate space. A recent study using 40 years of data and millions of species locations concluded that microclimatic buffering slows extinction. In the Nature Conservancy's climate resilience work, we spent over 10 years learning how to map connected microclimates. This is our climate resilience map. We had the help of over 287 scientists reviewing and developing the map, and on it, the green areas are the places with the most connected microclimates relative to the soil and geology and ecoregion it's in. We call these resilient sites, and they're great places for land investment because the physical properties that make them resilient will last into the future. We've created a web tool where you can zoom in anywhere on this map and explore the soils, the geology, the microclimates, the connectivity, and the carbon of that area. I'll put the link at the end of this uh, presentation and you can play with it on your own. It's fun and easy. The last slide showed climate resilient areas, but where are the current source areas for plants and animals? We created this map of recognized biodiversity areas from the eco-regional portfolios created by TNC and partners, and from the state wildlife action plans of conservation opportunity areas. The map shows places with intact habitats and viable populations of rare and common species. By merging this map of important biodiversity areas, with the climate resilient sites map, we can start to identify resilient source areas. Now things are getting exciting. This map shows key areas for climate flow, that gradual movement of populations in response to climate. Places where species movements are likely to be concentrated and where we might be able to bring the whole social network, history and culture along. Staring at this map, we realized that if we embedded those resilient source areas in this connected network, it might create a larger network that could ensure species would grow, thrive, move, and change. This is the result of bringing all three of those maps together. It's what we call the resilient and connected network. It's big. It's 34% of the land area in the country. But it has resilient examples of every geology, soil type, every ecoregion. It has over 250,000 biodiversity areas, and it's configured to allow for movement, to adapt to a changing climate. It also stores 29 billion tons of carbon right now and sequesters around 236 million more tons every year. That's equivalent to taking 188 million cars off the road every year. Why would we want to lose any of this network? Conservation is a social thing. Conserving a network at this scale is way beyond what any one organization can do but collectively we might achieve it. It's already almost half secured, 44%. And because it's built on representation, resilience, biodiversity, and connectivity, it's the perfect starting place for a 30 by 30 network. I echo Andrew Bowman's call from two years ago for organizing our collective efforts. You don't have to change how you make decisions. We all have our own processes and ways of doing things, 
and we all have our own data. That's good. Keep it, use it. My plea is that you start to bring this new science into your decision making. We've tried to make this easy by creating the resilience and carbon tools you can download from the TNC website. But you're going to have to do your own thinking about how to work with the plant and animal nations. And please teach your kids the truth. That the world is alive and full of beans. After all, we are humans. We like to interact. We're not going to care about an inanimate world. And don't forget that our most important partner is the living land. Thank you so much to the Land Trust Alliance for all the incredible work they do and for giving me the opportunity to present this talk. And thank you all for joining.